Please join me now in welcoming the phenomenal Elizabeth Debicki. Hello. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that, that I love in your performance and your portrayal is that you allow for the fragility and the vulnerability in her as a character and also this real fortitude and strength. And sometimes it's very quiet, sometimes it's a little bit louder throughout the season. Um, and I was interested in how you, when you were first approaching building her as a character for yourself, how you found the spaces in which that could always coexist within her. A very good, complex question. Um, well, I think, in a way, it's sort of what what you were saying is sort of what the Crown is always trying to do, right? It's always, which has been a really interesting conversation in the UK recently about fact, fiction, reality, whatever. And so it's it's sort of what we've been saying now for a few weeks. What we're trying to do always is sort of really get into that crevice, that really sort of private, intimate place. And I think that's what Peter does so beautifully, and that's always what he's writing for us to do. So um, it, it was a, a really interesting process getting getting into that. I I was I was doing press only recently for this here, and I and I found myself realizing that I had a lot of time because it was the pandemic, so I could sort of absorb and almost sort of by osmosis just spend a lot of time with her and try and understand what she was going through and and versus obviously the sort of public facing mask that we all that we all know so you know and she's obviously going through the breakdown of her marriage and is a sp in a space of extreme isolation and not really having people directly around her that she can share with easily and there's different ways in which that expresses itself throughout the season you know again sometimes it's the very quiet introverted moments with herself and how she carries herself and sometimes she's very outwardly expressive about her anger and her frustrations and so how did you approach calibrating based on where where she is in the season where she is in her life how you felt like she would be expressing these continued frustrations that she had at that point well i mean that's sort of what i adored about playing her in this time period as well because she starts off in this sort of there's almost a, there's something sort of unformed at the core of her, and and so much of the struggle that I found myself playing was of of ownership of the self, you know, which is such an incredibly difficult thing to come across as a normal person. But if you're trying to sort of establish who you are at your core and find that authentically whilst being watched by the world, it's an exceptionally difficult thing to do. And so I feel like that's sort of what the journey is in this season of, of somebody who's incredibly raw, really, at the beginning and, and then learns how to, or, or at least we watch her try to sort of grab a hold of the reins of the narrative of who she is. And there's always a duality, isn't there? There's sort of what she wants the world to know and believe about her is just sort of have them on side. And then there's also the, the truth of who she is, really, at her core. and and. They, I think the thing with Diana is they often are the same thing because what she is is incredibly honest about herself. She always was so honest, you know, which takes an incredible amount of courage to, to, to be vulnerable and be honest and let people into that. So, Absolutely. And obviously in working on a show like The Crown, there's an incredible amount of research that goes into it with Peter Morgan and his entire team. And I've heard that, that when they were asking about what research you wanted, your answer was everything. And given how much there is because of the time period in terms of video footage and photographs and interviews that you could look at for reference, how did you then take the research that they had accumulated and distill down what are the pieces that are going to be really useful to me in finding both who she is a, as a character emotionally and then even just the physicality of that as well well we have a, we do have this amazing research department and the, the lady who runs it her name is Annie and I had a zoom with Annie I was in Australia and, and Annie said what do you want and I said I like give me everything um, which I immediately regretted because I'm someone who loves to do my homework and then I open up this little archive and I was like holy cow Jesus Christ but I had this time because it was the pandemic and so that was a really interesting process because I think driven also driven by fear, by, by this sort of great juicy fear that definitely ebbed me along in the beginning of the process. I thought, well, I'm just gonna jump in 
as deep as I can. But of course, then that sort of was incredibly overwhelming because you think, how do you know? How can you know a life? How can you? How do? How do I get as close to the truth of things as possible? And I found myself watching a lot. I read a lot, but that was really interesting too because I would get. You know, I kind of knew I was starting to get close to something because I would I'd get a quarter of the way through the book and then I find myself sitting on the couch and thinking, how dare you? I mean, you know, <laughs> that's not true. I, it's so defensive. And then I think, Who'd wrote, who wrote this? So I, I, then I'd throw that book away and pick up the <laughs> new one. And I, honestly, I became like absolutely livid. I think, well, how do you know that's what she was thinking? How, you know? And so I read and I watched. But the things that I started to love were the... You know, I, I realized I was sort of hunting, hunting for un, for footage and things written that somehow didn't have an agenda. Um, I wanted the raw, the rawest things, and I also wanted to try. I mean, because it's interesting with these characters because they they are so public facing. They understand how to manipulate. So you're kind of always looking and hunting for the things that it's almost like you where they're not aware that split second you know or where something surprising might happen and you and the mask drops and so i was hunting around for a lot of sort of un unedited sort of newsreel footage you know that the bbc had of them getting out of a car when they went to korea and you know it was and it was some terribly distressing sad trip and and you see them just sort of sitting in the car before they know that someone's photographing them and and you look at their body language and you think oh that's that's interesting, and that's that's something I can hook into. But, but I had to spend enough time with it that it soaked in somehow. That I, I wasn't thinking when it when it came time to do it. And, and I think the same thing with the dialect, which, which I spent a lot of time doing. And and, and you know, and it's so funny. With I, I really, I was in Australia, and I was I was doing these Zoom calls with my dialect coach, who's a genius, and he has done all of these voices and created, you know, and they and we have these ridiculous practice sentences that we walk around saying things about Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. What's his hair made of? Where did he come from? And you walk around and <laughs> it's so, it's so, you know, and then everyone in your family's washing the dishes going, Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. And, and it's mad and you sort of just become completely obsessed with everything. But my poor sister, she'd be in the shower and she'd be doing these terrible, you know, she'd go, God damn it, Elizabeth, I'm doing Diana's voice all the time. But, um, but I, I sort of knew that there was this, it was this huge surplus that was available, and so I had to let the things that were going to stick, I just had to let them stick, and then the other stuff was always going to fall away, you know. But you're not in control of that, so, yeah. I also wanted to ask about working with Polly Bennett, who was a movement coach on the show as well, and what were some of the aspects that you found yourself just naturally determining about the physicality and the movement of this character for you, and then where did she really step in and help you, helping you to figure out some of the details, whether they were larger pieces or some of the more nuanced elements? Well, it's, I've never had a movement coach before, and, and I loved, what I loved about it was that I had this captive person who had to have the conversation with me. So if I wanted to talk about the sort of tilt of a head for an hour, you know, she had to do it, <laughs> which I loved. Because that's the sort of thing as an actor that I've always just sort of been, you know, you just do it on your sofa and you feel like you're going kind of mad. But so suddenly there was this amazing person there. And I, I guess it's interesting when you do these characters because what you want to be able to give the audience is is the satisfaction of, of recognition of, of something that we all sort of kind of is, is somehow enmeshed in our cultural consciousness, how these people sound, how they look, what they, how they occupy space. And I mean, working with her was fantastic because we all have a, a map, a blueprint in our body and, and the way we move is a response to that, you know, our psychology, our experiences. And, and so she kind of helped me understand the map and because I think when you you know when you play Diana everyone goes and does this thing with their neck and this thing with their eye <laughs> and so it's so funny you go yes there's that but you know and it's on honestly everybody does it like the burly painter who comes to your house oh you're playing Diana and then he goes <laughs> yeah all right thanks Jim that's great 
There's also a lot of, of delicacy and specific calibration, even just in the volume of delivery in your voice. You know, at the beginning when they're on vacation, she's very outwardly frustrated. So that's obviously a much louder conversation. And then I think about, you know, I think it was episode nine where it's Diana and Charles and they're having a conversation. And then it's almost a whisper by the time she's saying, well, William's the one that people want to see as king more now. Um, and so she's able to deliver something that feels very acerbic in a very, very soft manner. And so how did you find those sorts of calibrations and scenes? Would you have an idea going in or was a lot of that discovery in the moment? I think it's so, uh, sort of discovery in the moment, but I also think maybe it's, it's so interesting when you have these conversations because I've never thought about that before, but I guess she grows up a lot in the course of the, those six years. And I think that, that fight that we watch in episode one is, it's a young fight in a way. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of, I, I wouldn't say adolescent, but there's a kind of knee jerk, you know, it's, not, it's an unthinking kind of fight. But it, it's only six years, but I think within that six years, that character sort of, she, she has to grow up so hard and fast because of all the things that are coming at her. So, but I don't really know. I'm, I'm not often thinking when I'm doing things like that. So. I, I wouldn't know, but I guess that scene in episode nine is just such a brutally sad fight. It sits in a different place in the, in the body probably, yeah. And so much of this season is about her finding her way back to her central core and, and kind of refinding that relationship with herself, refinding her voice in, in new ways. And did you have an idea of, of what the end goal was of this is where I want her to get to as a person? Or was it as you went scene by scene, you started to kind of almost discover where you felt her center was gonna land? Um, probably a little bit of both, but I, I think it's, it's really fascinating doing a TV show like this because I've, I've not really done anything like this before where I really got given this incredible part and, and kind of the joy of doing TV is that you, you have so much time inside these people, but it also is this experience of you just sort of, someone sort of lets you out of the gate and then you're just going and you're going and you're going and you're going and there's a lot that becomes quite unconscious and you just come to work each day and this person sort of keeps coming out of you and... I think it was probably more something I understood in retrospect, but it's very clear to me now that I was constructing, and it's also to do with what Peter was writing for her, but I had someone say to me, what do, what do you think, what do you think if you had to sort of sum it up, this is about this story of her? And I sort of found myself thinking, well, I think it's about somebody knowing that there is something inside them that nobody, could touch and getting back into contact with that thing, you know, and that that is that source of strength and it's sort of the most precious thing we have, but we can lose touch with that. And I think that what happens to this person and we see it with how Emma played her and she's, it sort of gets ripped out of her hands so early in her life when you're in so incredibly young, like how can you even know it's there, you know, but through the course of this, I think that's what I was finding while I was playing her. And there's there's insecurities that come to the surface from moments where she's in the car and then her brakes aren't working and who could have possibly done this, being very aware of, I think people are listening on the phone, hearing clicks. And, you know, I almost don't even want to call it paranoia because it was warranted on her part. Um, and so what did that open up in, in her emotional landscape for you in knowing that if that's her day to day, every time she picks up the phone to call her son, someone could be listening. This could be a story in the papers tomorrow. I mean, it's, de it's a devastating kind of um, part of her because she, she was right. And we know history tells us that she was right about it. And I think this happens to people in these positions where they're not believed and, in fact, their instincts are completely accurate. I think what it does is that she's already in a in an extremely vulnerable place and it just completely destabilizes her if you don't feel like your most intimate space is is safe then it, it really sort of starts to dismantle your capacity to grasp reality but also i think your your capacity to understand who you can trust and so much of this story for her in episode in season 5 is is a, is a story of 
of watching her sort of lose a grip on something because she doesn't know who she can trust. And, and I think that if you're in a position where you're so watched, you, you need allies, you know, and, and she didn't have them. And I think that's what's so tragic. And I mean, on the other side of her as a character, I love that we get such an exploration of her sense of humor and the lightness that exists. You know, I love the scene where she first shows up and is sitting with Muhammad Al-Fayed and they just have five in-jokes with one another within about two minutes. And what did that open up in the way that you viewed her and the way that you were able to play her and always being able to go to that side as well? Well, for me, it was a joy. I used to joke all the time after doing some terribly sad crying scene. I'd think, God, I was trying to turn the crown into a comedy one scene at a time, you know. I'd say to my director, can't you have the hiccups in this scene or anything? <laughs> no, you know. And so I, I was always looking for these moments where I... Because when, when I started to do that research and I also spoke to quite a lot of people, strangely, I realised I knew quite a lot of people who had been very close to her. And... Um, the thing that I always heard people say, and I, th I almost felt like it was vital to the people who knew her to get across this, that she, yes, she had an incredibly tragic life in so many ways, but her vitality and her humor and her joy were so, so vivid. And, you know, you just, as soon as people start talking about, you know, you hear like, well, I was doing this speech and I got up and she was sitting next to me the entire time she was pinching my bum and she just thought that was glorious, you know, and you think, I love that person. I just love that person. And, and it was really important to me as much as I could to thread that through, whether it was, it's with the boys or... Because I think it's, there's something so childlike in the best way, you know, that she, she still had that sense of play, which is remarkable considering how difficult everything was, so... Absolutely. Well, we have a couple of questions again that were submitted to us beforehand, and then if we have time, we'll take some in the room. The first one is from Corey Andrews, um, which you were touching upon this a little bit before, but given the pressure actors often feel to deliver their strongest and most believable performances, did you feel even more added pressure portraying Princess Diana? And if yes, how did you prepare to play such an iconic and beloved public figure? Um, I think, I mean, I definitely felt a tremendous amount of pressure. In a funny way, it's almost diff it was almost separate to the pressure to do good acting. The pressure to do, do like good acting is always a thing, <laughs> but um, it was more about a responsibility, a totally unique feeling of a responsibility to do something justice. It's it's kind of not quite tangible. It's hard to express, but it's it is a sense of um, I know we all felt it. We've all spoken about it a lot. This sense of just being as honest inside of these people as we could be. So, but then, of course, the research was also sort of a duality. There's this sense of of archival research and 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 part of that getting as close to that person and being as honest and gleaning as much information as you can, and then and then just the sort of layers of technicality that go that go into playing something like this. Uh, the next one is from David Nemitz, who's talking about episode nine, obviously the, the phenomenal scene that we were discussing before. Episode nine has the great extended scene between Diana and Charles at Kensington and takes an honest look at their broken marriage. Could you talk about what went into shooting that scene? Well, um, it's an amazing scene. It's a, it's a really long scene. And um, Dom and I started calling it our one act play. We, di we didn't see each other very much on set because the stories are just, they don't intertwine really until that point in the, in the season. And every time I'd see him in the trailer, the sad car park where our trailers were, I'd say, when are we doing that play? And he'd be, I don't know, in December. You know, so it was like this thing on the horizon all the time. And, and then we had this beautiful luxury of rehearsing it. And then we had three days to shoot it, which is also really unusual. And we moved through different sets to get these little moments in. There was also an entire day spent making an omelette. I li I'm not exaggerating. An entire day spent making an omelette, and I think there's 40 seconds of it in the scene. And it was, this is a true story, it was the day that Peter came to set, and he got so grumpy, he said, are you going to make that omelette all day? And we were like, yes. And then he sort of laughed. <laughs> I don't know, it was just the scheduling. But I, yeah, I think I made 42 omelettes or something. Um, and then, and I don't know, I, I wonder if that was almost a kind of, we were so relaxed after making the omelette 40 times, that then we sat down, at the kitchen table, there was always, I also loved that, that, that when we entered into this scene that we knew inevitably was gonna descend into this really painful place, we were always laughing still about the scrambled eggs. So it has this beautiful movement through it and, and um, for me it's the kind of material that you 
that you really want. You know, it's the ki- it's the kind of material that feels like a gift because you just get to explore so much in the in the scene. And and I love doing it, and I loved working with Dom. I think he's an incredible actor, and he absolutely broke my heart. And um, that was the day he gave me a compliment. <laughs> it's a big day for me. And um, he went, "Yes, you know, you're brilliant." And I went, "Oh, a compliment." <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, no, we just I adored it, and I and I think, it's, as happens often on the Crown, the the material that that I was doing is is heavy, and it's and it takes you to a really s- deeply sad place. But there's also a sort of part of your actor's brain that is just having the most amazing time because you get to do this territory and you get to do it with these amazing people. And yeah, that was definitely one of the, they, I, I'm like crying, and there's all this snot pouring down my face and then this little actor's antenna I, like pokes up and goes, God, this is so good. <laughs> this is so much fun. And then you go back into the scene, yeah. And then there's more omelets. And then there's more omelets and, and more snot, always <laughs> the snot. And it's such an incredible scene. Um, I believe we'll, we'll have the microphones come around again. We should have time for one or two quick questions. Um, yeah, right over there. Hi, I'm Corey Murray. Um, I'm curious because in watching this, you know, in knowing Diana's life, I always thought, wow, you know, Will and Harry lost their mother so young. But in in watching, I wonder, have you has your empathy changed for what she really lost? Because me personally, I'm like, wow, she really lost who she was even before she was a mother. So I wonder, what do you think people should be most empathetic for um, in playing now that you've played Diana? Oh, I mean. It's a re- there's sort of multi layers to that answer, but I think in a in a kind of simple way, what I've learned in playing her is is how the media was incredibly destructive in her life, and I think that shocked me the extent to which it manipulated and all, it's, you know in a, in many ways she's the symbol of of invasion in a way, of the paparazzi, of the chases, of all, and, and we know that she's emblematic of that, but the actual sort of slow destruction of trust, of, un, of understanding, of public rapport, of the consequences of being separated from the family, the loss of security, all that sort of, that slow sort of degradation is, was, was devastating for me to learn. In a way, I couldn't believe when I was learning this that by the end of her life, sh- she was just out on the street by herself. You just think, how is that possible? She was, she was so vulnerable, and um, and I think it sort of forced her to kind of move toward things that would protect her, and and that's a specific kind of set and people. And so, I think that was one of one of the things. But um, I think the other thing that, and I hope this is what the show can show as well, is that despite how difficult things were for her, the, the strength that she possessed and the courage to sort of continue, it's sort of unfathomable to me that you would be sort of broken down by so many things and yet you would still possess the generosity of spirit to reach to people and give them the thing that you're not getting from anywhere. You know, t- when we think of her, we think of this woman who was capable of giving people so much love. And also the thing that she was able to do was to see people, really sort of see people. And and of course the tragedy was that nobody really ever saw her, really, for who she was in a way. You know, they saw a construction and, and by the end they saw what they wanted to see as a result of really how the British media was sort of deciding one day to the next who they would support, who they wanted to throw under the bus. And I think that was, you know, kind of, that's part of the tragedy of it. I have to say, especially having grown up in the UK or around this time, it's absolutely phenomenal to see what you've captured in your portrayal of her. So congratulations on an incredible season. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. And thank you so much to all of you as well for coming thank out. Thank you so much. Time.